Welcome to the Huntington Beach Art Center for panel discussion and closing reception of By Degrees Art and Our Changing Ecology. It's an exhibition that's been open since April. It was presented by our esteemed curators, Luciana Abate and Lawrence Ice. And <laughs> we have our moderator here, Virginia Arce uh, from the Irving Fine Arts Center. So uh, we also have several of our artists who are represented in the exhibition. I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves, speak a little bit. Um, I'll just tell you the Huntington Beach Art Center has been around since about 1995. We have a really great exhibition schedule. We do four to six exhibitions a year. Some are open call, some are jury, some are invitational. But we try and make it uh, as inclusive as we possibly can and invite as many of our artists from not only Southern California, just around the world to exhibit within our galleries here in downtown Huntington Beach. So with no further ado, I will pass it over to our fabulous panel. And thank you all so much. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you so much, Larry and Luciana, for inviting me. Um, as the curators of the exhibition, uh, I'd love to hear you talk about how the um, your curatorial framework for the exhibition and how you made um, the aesthetic and kind of decisions that you did in putting this together. Uh, let's see. Well, the structure of the exhibition was. Um, uh, a kind of a core of artists that we've been working with for a few years uh, that are, have been addressing environmental issues in, through their work in not so much documentary way but more of a transformative way as part of their studio practice and um, then we had an open call uh, on top of that it was kind of a hybrid situation where uh, you know we were allowed to kind of choose people that we knew uh, pretty well and then open it up to the community which opened up a whole nother uh, wonderful kind of realm of artists that we didn't, were not aware of. Um, and uh, that was one of the big happy surprises after the open call, that it really became a balance of people that we knew and people that were new to us. And so uh, you know, I, I think we were pleased with the balance that happened with that. Well, yeah, I think... Um as we, you say, uh, we had incredible surprises in the jury part of the exhibition, and um, and we thought it was so important to include um, community members uh, as part of this project to make the, this project inclusive, relevant, and impactful, and hopefully, um, you know, kind of create some sense of collective responsibility and inspire this community to, to face certain issues and uh, try to, yeah, to tackle the challenges of the environmental issues, and especially the challenges that this community uh, presents. Um, so, yeah. Um, on the subject of community and bringing community together for an exhibition that addresses environmentalism in all different facets, um, Larry, you had mentioned that you were also interested in doing something that was a little bit um, uh, different from the kind of mega, like the art fairs, and um, a little bit outside of a system that is maybe not so sustainable in putting together a large exhibition. You know, anybody who knows me knows that I'll go into the strange rants about this issue. And that um, I think that, uh, I mean, we'll, and I think we'll get to this more on the panel as we, as we go to the artists, and I want to get to them soon. Um, but uh, the responsibility of an artist within the ecosystem, within the ecological system, I think, I think um, our biggest downfall is uh, these art fairs and huge shows like the Venice Biennale and this and that, which I'm not saying get rid of them, but I'm saying we need to look at them and offer alternatives to this way of making art and to, and it's really like, um, beholding to capitalism and that kind of the money system. All the shipping, private planes coming in with collectors, all kind of things. I think that that's, uh, that's not a really good look for an environmental artist. And um, if we can try to create more localized shows, this is a perfect example of all the work came from, you know, just within an hour of this place. Uh, Luciana and I drove all the stuff from LA down in our cars in one trip. 
And then the, we have on someone from Taiwan, but that came in as data, as a video. So you can have an international show, you just have to find more innovative ways to bring, that, bring those artists together that uh, can be carbon free. Okay, um, on the subject of sustainability, um, my first question is for Beth, Beth Davila Waldman, whose artwork is to the right. Um, uh, Beth, can you talk a little bit more about um, what the landscape that inspired the work is and how you're using the material uh, that you used in the work to address some of the issues of sustainability and overall what you think is most important about this work? Yeah, well, uh, the material you're looking at, um, the pieces um, constructed out of tarp, um, white and black commercial tarp, um, cotton canvas and, and acrylic paint and, and photography through a photo transfer process. Um, I've been um, working with, with landscape in particular um, as a motif in my work in this landscape from uh, the Lancaster and Antelope Valley area. Um, it's the first piece of a series I'm working on this year, so it, it's 2013, but the, the connection um, that I've developed with LA and then and the surrounding areas over the Three Mountains is kind of symbolic to my relationship with um, landscape from um, Peru, from my mother's homeland, um, southern Peru in the sense that a city in an area of Peru where half my family is from has a, a similar relationship with the, the city in three mountains and on the other side is a continuation in a vast desert where people are also moving out of the city and migrating to and establishing home and working with the conditions. And in particular, this landscape is, um, is you know, this area of California has also been um, where current um, residents from LA have been migrating to in more current times, but also over decades um, there has been uh, there have been people who moved out west to establish homes and essentially taken it from the natives from the Native Americans and and figured out ways to um, cultivate it and make it their new home. So the landscapes. Um, when I try to look at it and read it on, at a starting point photographically, it's, it's charged with a lot of um, political elements and thinking about um, the sort of um, migrations and also um, the, the attention that is, is given to um, those areas or what populations are ignored. So it's kind of a, a global lens when, in my work, but um, since I've been... Um, a resident of California for 25, 26 years, and in um, Southern California, the past two and a half to three, I, you know, really wanted to look locally, um, which I guess kind of fits in with the theme. And tarp came from again looking at um, through different travels, including a lot of my studies and observations in Peru. Like it was an economically accessible material for a lot of different purposes, but. Um, to boil it down to the idea of shelter and protection, which um, we can witness in the LA area and many other cities um, through tent cities, but also like used as temporary walls or sometimes more permanent walls and areas that you know people are extending beyond urban areas and, and trying to create home and protection. Um, and so. Um, um, I think you asked, I mean, you know, tarp is pretty um, tough. It's not a typical um, art material, maybe, uh, but I like the idea of its longevity and how I can work with it in a, a physical way. And um, it does have a, um, it is an artwork, but it can also extend because of its material quality still as a, a material of protection. Yeah, thank you, Beth. Um, I, I want to come back to the subject of photography in a minute, um, but talking about um, uh, land that's used for um, 
or uh, capitalistic ends for extraction and things of that sort. Um, I want to ask Constance about her work in the exhibition. She has two works um, in the galleries um, to the back. Uh, obviously, the first one that I'll ask you about is the, ti the title is If Amazon's Stupid. <laughs> uh, can you um, introduce that work for us and um, how you were uh, approaching that, the subject of um, the environment okay. and the material as well? Well, I mean, I have a kind of a long history of maybe a 40-year practice of working landscape imagery. Um, and you had a question about scale and about you know, how landscape is typically on grander presentation. Mm -hmm. And so I did work with that for years of these huge panoramic landscapes, and, um, which were sort of collage-like um, the paintings Vast, vast landscape collages of melding all different kinds of landscapes together. So, um, and that was um, done by uh, appropriating thousands of landscape photographs and uh, connecting them together in the painting. And so a shift kind of took place uh, in the early 2000s where um, in my daily walk, I began to see kind of when I thought, I wanted to be a little more aware and present of my actual environment rather than this appropriate photo environment. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, the walks took me through alleys and byways and also the urban streets. And of course, I couldn't help but notice the amount of waste uh, in this trash can. So um, that had a pretty profound impact on me. Just this kind of first-hand uh, look at just my basically mostly my neighborhood, then multiplying it by <laughs> So the uh, the amount of physical waste uh, really uh, sort of created an urgency in me to uh, work with that. Um, experience of seeing that rather than just this, this photo appropriation technique. So, um, uh, but the, the early landscapes, the panoramas were really about uh, <coughs> challenging perceptions of typical landscapes, looking at the myths and fictions and the, the sort of cliché tropes behind landscape presentation. And in a way I found myself going back to that even that idea even with these uh, newer pieces. And um, so I, I fancied myself a bit of a, a, a flaneur or flaneuse, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, if you think of your Walter Benjamin uh, and his discussion of Baudelaire uh, roaming through the Parisian streets and kind of uh, looking at the underbelly and the substratum uh, and kind of contrasting that with an idealized sense of the city or an idealized street uh, and creating this kind of friction between the two was really interesting to Benjamin, but it, it was also very interesting to me as well because we have this, this vast city that presents a certain face of uh, Consumerism, wealth, um, urban sprawl, all this sort of stuff, and then you have the consequences of that. So uh, uh, that became very interesting to me. So um, the styrofoam piece was—it was one of those just kind of light bulb projects. That, hey, you know, this would be fun to, to put images on, and um, uh, first of all, see what it looked like. Um, just as a piece, so there's always that kind of uh, formal technical challenge you have to overcome, and um, and then I think the the content kind of flows out of that. So um, and what you have there is really a merging of the subject and the object. So the uh, you can't really consider one without the other. And, um, so you have the object, you have the, the picture of, say, a, a gorilla or a lamp of Amazon, 
but at the same time it's on the the very thing that's just wrong. And so there's this interesting kind of relationship that circles around me. And, and um, so that, that fascinated me. And um, and also, you know, Larry was talking about this, this art world that we have to deal with. And so it nicely, I thought, fit into a critique of our art marketing in the sense that these were paintings that were pretty difficult to market. I mean, uh, who wants to buy paintings on trash? So there was a little bit of, you know, there was a, a critique of that system built in, and I kind of, little Duchampian fun with, uh, you know, making paintings on trash and trash out of paintings, and uh, so I, I'm having a lot of fun with it. We also have fun with the idea of, like, the shipping and all of it, because, I mean, the styrofoam pieces, throw them in a plastic bag and you take them back to the studio, you paint on them, you throw them back in the same plastic <laughs> bag, and so I took them out of the trunk of my car and just put them in the plexi. I know, I know. <laughs> so it's yeah, yeah. the piss out of the whole, like... Truth be told, you know, <laughs> I did drive down here. But anyway, the, uh, the real um, hope there is just to uh, have a focus on the present and the things that are happening that tend to be put out of sight in our trash bins and haul away and we never think about them again once we have a nice little product we got from Amazon that gives the sort of butterfly effect of you know, yeah, you're you're getting your nice object but look at the consequences here. So um, so you know the, there's a lot of um, threads that run through, you know, the past 40 years of work, and I, I just see this as another aspect of it, you know, exploring landscape and what it means today, what, what, uh, uh, how we think about things. Um, I want to uh, put a pin in the, you said hope, um, which I think is a really important thing to consider also when we're thinking about the environment and environmental concerns. Um, or any kind of work that's addressing the earth. So with that in mind, uh, my question for uh, Voice Lab. Yes. Did I say that correctly? Voice. Um, the title of uh, one of your paintings in the exhibition is Transfiguration, um, which to me reads like it has uh, a spiritual kind of connotation. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the painting and some of the symbolism that we're looking at? Um, thank you. Be before I give you an uh, answer to, to that question, I really want to say that um, I'm so happy that I participate in this show. I typically don't apply for open calls, but after seeing who are curators, knowing what they are doing, I really felt that, you know, there are various shows in, the, in LA and California, and there are like those transactional things and transformational things. And I just felt that, you know, in my gut that I have to apply. No matter what, you know, uh, result could be, I felt that this will be a very good show because I'm, I'm following what those curators are doing. And I was like, I'm applying. <laughs> so when I came here and when I saw the, the, the installation and how many artists I personally know of, that I'm following what they're doing, I really feel that this is um, a beautiful transformational uh, power of art. Um, so talking about now uh, my painting, um, actually, you know, artistic practice is kind of a therapy for me, and I'm in this stage when I'm trying to make a painting that is intelligent like that it's telling you some kind of story and maybe like twisting you as a viewer, um, like teasing you, but you have to do kind of like research. Again, I do not expect from people to know what I wanted to say. Um, and that's why there is like, you know, artist statements and other stuff. So uh, my original idea about title, uh, about this painting is that it's about cycles. Um, so you can see that there is like a toy that looks like a dinosaur that maybe refers to the to the you know current like you know situation where we have a layer on a on a, on a you know crust of of the earth that it's filled now with plastic. 
um, and we call the new age of um, uh, Anthropocene, geological, new geological era. So I really wanted to, to use the toy or something, and it's actually a toy by, uh, that, that was saved by my um, husband, that's his childhood toy. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically it's made of plastic, and plastic is uh, you know, made of oils from trees that were, you know, getting that ancient sun. Uh, so at the same time, it's about cycles of the whole earth, but it's like, again, referring to these like dinosaurs that are a species that does not exist anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, trans uh, transfiguration. Um, so I'm from Belgrade. I'm, I'm, I'm actually from Valjevo, but I lived in Belgrade and. Um, five, six years ago, I moved here, um, and interesting stuff about Balkan and, and this historic event that were happening there um, is that basically Transfiguration was established by, um, I think, Catholic Church after the fall of Belgrade when the Turks come, came. Mm -hmm. So it's again actually just like you know, signaling the new cycle when the Byzantine Empire fall, and there is like those cultural cycles, um, geological cycles, and of course something that it's like just um, again the cycle that the art world in general um, is very um, capitalistic driven. So for me, it's really important to like dedicate my art to the process, not actually to the product. So um, the painting also kind of has that religious uh, appearance. I wanted to create something that looks like religious art, but it's not. Um, and through other works, I do exp kind of like trying to touch upon the, the theme of violence and religion connected to the to the landscape. So for me the painting that has those like side panels and that it's like telling the story, it's actually one of the main instruments that um, during colonization of any kind, um, you know, when religion is using the icons that are portable, so you can like fold it down and you can send it to uh, preach Christianity or any other religion. So that was very political um, decision, so um, it's a lot of things happening there. Yeah. Um, gosh, I wish we had like five hours for this talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, on, on, uh, we've mentioned um, uh, urbanization, we've mentioned um, this kind of, well, we've tiptoed, I feel like, around the idea of the sublime. Um, my question for Isikaya and uh, Thomas George um, is about um, simulation um, because their works in the exhibition, um, the video that we encountered when we first come into the exhibition space, um, when I first encountered it, I, I, for a second I thought it was a scene from Blade Runner um, and then the photograph that's towards the rear of the gallery um, that's titled Second Nature. Um, I'd love to hear how you both uh, think about simulation and um, what that means in our environment that we've constructed and transformed so dramatically. Um, so simulation, I think, is not a concept that we usually run around with, like constantly thinking about it, but it's tightly related to something that is uh, important for our practice, which is like the perception of reality. Um, and I think since we mostly work with, with camera systems, uh, which are like, you know, optical systems that obviously capture factual light that is in front of us. Um, we we think about the world that we see and and <laughs> what it does to us, right? So, uh, if you look at second nature, the, the the idea of simulation, of course, is like very present because there are cell towers that try to be a tree, right? They simulate. Uh, something that we could call a reality that is uh, that exists even without us, right? But I mean, we were talking about it earlier a little. The, the, the very concept of reality is such a complex uh, thing, and the many many discourses that evolve around it, that we 
Uh, we usually try to, I think, step back and just like really ask ourselves as well, okay, what are we seeing here right now? Uh, because in our case, we, uh, we came to uh, the US or to Southern California uh, a few years ago. And so for us, uh, this was a totally new environment. And using the camera, for us, it really was just a process of, of getting to know where we are and, and processing what we are seeing. Because it is such a different environment from uh, Sheikh is from Turkey. I'm from Germany, and uh, the places that we grew up in were nothing like Southern California. It's like, I mean, of course, we grew up in cities, and we, we're like used to uh, manufactured landscapes, but the level of manufacturing here in Southern California, it's just a different quality. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like... It is hyper real, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. This, um, this, this feeling that we get when we're... I mean, sometimes even surreal. It's like... Mm -hmm. It definitely transcends the idea that we had in our minds of what reality is, and um, and this this constant feeling of being in a hyper real place it, it, it really shifts your perception, or it, it certainly did in my case, mm -hmm. yeah. and yours as well, I guess. <laughs> but what did you first when you first saw like an oil pump right next to a, someone's home, you know, or a, con <laughs> a bunch of condos? I mean, what did you think? I mean, the first thought was, this looks very unhealthy, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> uh, which obviously is the case. Um, but yeah, I mean, th that's, I think, what is so fascinating to us in, in LA and Southern California in general, the, the, the proximity of, of realms that uh, are often divided. You know, you have an industrial landscape somewhere, and then you have residential areas. And here, everything is just bleeding into each other. <laughs> And um, and I think what you just said, the hyper real that, that we also aim for in our work, uh, it, it is pretty easy to find here. I mean, if you just like put your lens somewhere and there's an oil pump in front of a, of a condo or a McDonald's, uh, if, if you compile it in a certain way, then uh, people encounter our work and often ask, is this, is this CGI? Is this uh, like a, a rendering? Is this, mm -hmm. they're like, mm-mm. <laughs> this is pretty straightforward Southern California. <laughs> just the, the, the it's a little bit of cold production. <laughs> it's pretty much it, yeah. Um, I originally, when I was thinking of what I wanted to ask everyone in the panel, um, a, a follow-up question that I had for you both was how you, whether or not you view your work as being. Um, uh, critical as being more of an observation, of being somewhere in between. But I guess that question is really applicable to anyone in the panel. So I would love to hear anyone's thoughts about how you view your work and all the different kind of layers of history and, you know, politics and, and affect and like, how do you kind of view your work um, in this exhibition in that regard? Question. Huge question. Huge question. You can knock it out in a minute. <laughs> uh, well, I would say there's there's a lot of overlap in all of it. Um, the historical piece, that's the critical piece. Uh, you know, on and on and on. The theoretical. So, um, and I would say there's the aspect of all of those in this book here. Um, uh, you know, I think it's important to me to try to have those layers in my work and to, to address them, um, uh, not in a didactic way, I hope, although this is probably the most didactic and uh, direct piece I've ever made. Because, I mean, artwork does depend on ambiguity for its, some of its lasting power. And, um, so uh, it's a dance, you know, dance, especially for painting, uh, which has such a long and rich tradition uh, to weigh everything against. You know, uh, I thought of Casper David Friedrich when I saw your painting mm -hmm. immediately. You know, the Romantic era of uh, landscape painting and that connection to shaping and this sort of spiritual experience. Um, and so that's that, uh, 
that's a wonderful part of that, you know, to connect to that history. At the same time, you know, you've got a contemporary critique going on, with the dust and the plastic toys and, um, you know, those, those kinds of issues that you're bringing in. So, um, there's, uh, you know, I think that makes for a very rich art experience that you're able to layer in all of those kinds of things. Um, and uh, I aspire to that. Um, you know, the other thing about painting is uh, where I think, you know, it's certainly not going to stop that song from thrilling. <laughs> um, <laughs> nor is it going to stop people from using plastic or Amazon or whatever. Um, it does have a built-in respect and a built-in following you go to any museum in the country full time. So as a painter, you, you kind of have an immediate uh, respect for that tradition which hopefully will draw viewers in just because of its acknowledged uh, value. And so um, then, then once you've got that, you can kind of use that tradition and that respect to kind of shake things up a little bit. Yeah, so, uh, you know, that's a nice thing about being a fan. I can't speak for video artists or, but you know, that you probably have some things to say about that. Well, I mean, it's, uh, I, yeah, I definitely have been using paint in my work, and there's a very painterly context to my work, but um, that's not where my practice necessarily um, I haven't led being a painter. Um, I, I really come from a sculptural background, and um, I think it's um, the work I've been doing over the past years has um, I've, I've struggled with the paint um, or the context of painting um, as I've been pushing off the wall, but um, in using um, the canvas and still a context, a relationship with the wall with this piece in particular. It, it is falling into that realm of paint. And um, so, but um, um, just like uh, Constance said, yeah, all those layers are really important to my work too. And I think what um, um, this piece um, and pieces in, in this nature have been um, great in being able to transport them. Um, by rolling them up um, and their durability um, and you know they unfold and kind of have also a, a context of maybe um, a, a banner or, or scroll um, is a direction but in using the the tarp um, itself it's also so not high end so there's this big contrast or I'm putting it all together the the canvas and the tarp, and I, I guess I'm pushing that question within a painterly context, yet, I mean, you know, the styrofoam, and I'm trying to um, get a million miles out of tarp, and materials become really important to me, so um, even projects I'm working on right now have um, gone beyond tarp to other materials, but I'd say the foundation of how I've been describing a lot of my work has been very um, photographic-based. Um, which, I'm interested, Beth, though, in yeah. how um, what I see in your work is this intervention in the photographic process mm -hmm. and why photography and why making an image illegible, illegible um, that is already not so specific enough that a, a casual viewer would be able to say that's the Antelope Valley or that's... Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really fascinated in your very deliberate act to essentially destroy the image or transform it, however you want to characterize yeah. it. But it's doing something very different than what historical landscape photography would be concerned with. Well, I, I mean, I think there's, um, like, landscape photography or landscape, you know, is depicting that, whether it's a romantic viewpoint or some viewpoint, and depending on different... Um, you know, whoever the artist is or the period, but I, I, and photography has this idea to communicate an idea of um, this is reality of one moment in time. While framed, it's still 
you know, perhaps like the, the video work that you're creating, you know, this, you know, maybe a little touch up, but it, it's the reality of the LA landscape, even though it seems unbelievable. And um, there's just that diving into questioning and, and thinking about time to um, the static uh, photograph alone um, is um, an entry point, but um, there's so many, I guess, of those layers going on, and I, I'm feeling that the other media that I use helps push it into that space of questioning and of change. Um, so um, there's a huge letting go and almost like um, jumping into the situation, like the photographs, a bit of a guide. So when I'm in the moment capturing, photographing, it's, it's um, often been a starting point for me to see through my lens and discover a place and then there are all these thoughts going on, and um, that one image alone can't necessarily speak to a lot of the, the questions or conditions that I'm considering. And while I use, um, I'm not trying to deliver a detailed message, there's just the, the use of the paint and the physical quality that comes into the photograph, which I really like. I mean, really, the um, having a different relationship to a photograph that's more in the realm of um, sculptural sculptural painting gives it a bit more of a subjective space. Um, so it's a bit more like postmodern photography in the sense of um, it, it's not, um, it's very uh, uh, touchable, yeah, tactile. And, and so when I'm wrestling with these huge transfers in um, my studio, it's also, there's a lot of letting go. It's just it's kind of process, and it's also um, and the scale tends to be around this size. So I, in general, um, yeah. So I guess it's leaning towards that that process of figuring it out too, and a lot of letting go. I can't. I, I the conditions I create aren't. I have to let go. I don't know where the photograph will break or tear, um, and that's um, part of the space that I that I feel when I'm looking at these landscapes. It's interesting because I think if from the curator's point of view, we see photography used in almost every way I can imagine in, in a certain respect because you have like Ryan McIntosh behind you there. These are silver gelatin prints, super conservative style, you know, in terms of like hand developed and all that of, of this uh, transformation of the Tracy Hills area up near San Francisco mm -hmm. in this huge development that Amazon's building for the workers. And so just like straight photography in that kind of 30s Robert Adams mm -hmm. sort of way, and then C.C. Young behind you, nothing done to those photos that are particularly technically different, but the, the way he's photographed it has such a richness that it almost seems like a, a diorama or something mm -hmm. that's set up. And then uh, Lane, who's here in the front, this, this Bartness, uh, these different landscapes that are definitely interfered with in some way in terms of the color, and I think for you, Beth, this kind of interference is kind of metaphorical for, for the landscape being, you know, disrupted in some way. The same with me, interference, you know, what she said. It's like, after a while, the photography is so prolific, and you look at it on our phones, it's on Instagram, you see it everywhere, and after a while, you know, and I love the black and white straight photography, that's where I came from, but after a while you begin to feel like it's, it's so neutral, there's, there's something in me that isn't present in the work, and the only thing I can do about it is to just, and really I wanted to destroy it, I wanted to destroy the image as an act of, you know, self-expression so that I could um, reinterpret it make it in my own, you know, it needed to have my feeling and my emotion in it, and I, it's the only way that I can do that. So that, that range I thought was very interesting that we, we just seemed to kind of get a really rich slice of through, because I think the environment or reaction to the environment, photography is a pretty natural sort of tool to deal with that. Probably more natural than painting, but, you know. We'll do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think you're just the closeted pain. Yeah, yeah, that's good to be true. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but... <laughs>
Um, I think we have a few minutes for one last question for the panel. Yeah, we are right at about exactly one minute. Did you all want to respond to the photography uh, I mean, and you? Yeah, yeah. I want to add something about landscape in general because this exhibition really proves that there is no such a thing as <laughs> just the landscape. Landscape always has subtitles, and no matter if you're like presenting it, it is a video of a very brutal scene where we see excavation of the, it could be very direct, mm -hmm. but it could be like, in, in that case, this is a photography that we, we don't know, or we, we don't know what actually is happening on that landscape, or what kind of history that landscape has, and suddenly those marks that looks, that they are kind of like mistakes, or they're like very intentionally, weirdly, place are almost like unlocking that like you know thinking about what actually happened there why there is end of road why, why is like all these little subtle decisions that you did in order to make it really brings that like really layered situation all around us mm -hmm. every landscape is not just the landscape it's always subtext there mm -hmm. I would say every photograph is not just <laughs> um, Does anyone else on the panel want to add anything? Well, you know, when I was researching for the show, when you say ecology, we really have, it's, it's, I didn't know, but I didn't really look at it that way. There are many ecologies, because, you know, of, of the world. Yeah. And um, I think that for us as curators, we kind of wanted to have the widest lens possible in terms of what kind of fit into that idea of ecology. And uh, landscape comes up a lot because, well, that's where we are and that's what we're destroying. So when Beth and I put together a landscape show last year, a lot of the work just naturally was about, yeah, if you want a catalog. If you want a catalog from that show, I brought some stuff. Uh, it just became, they became naturally about climate change, you know, because that's, when we look at our landscape now, how, how can we see, we can see the beauty of it, but then we just turn around and there's something else, so uh, it's not so beautiful, so it, it seemed na naturally that it occurred, you know. the few when we first came to the lake, but then later for this project we um, did our research beforehand. We were living in San Diego back then, so on Fridays we were driving here, spending a night or two nights sleeping in our car and then driving back, so we had to be prepared and know where to go. And we found this article on LA Times. Um, they did a really good research and had a map uh, mapping all of the oil wells and oil infrastructures in LA. Um, so we followed that map, used Google Street View, and then, yeah, just drove around at night till, you know, early hours um, of the sun, like till 4 or 5 a.m. So that's how it went. But mostly they're shot here, uh, Long Beach, Signal Hill. Uh, we went all the way up to um, Ventura, that area as well. But it's basically LA. There's a question, a uh, woman in the back with the scarf. Yeah. Um, yes. I wonder, you know, you have the
I'm sorry, we're out of time, but who's going to answer that one first? Well, I, I should say one way that I cope with that enormous question and burden as a, an artist making work that pertains to the environment is rather than see it as all on my shoulders as an artist, but, you know, I have this huge responsibility um, to see the visual arts as just a link in a cultural chain so that uh, visual arts are linked to uh, literature and music and film and it's all in one chain that acts in concert with one another. And so I think that's the only way I can make sense of how my efforts would mean anything is that we're acting together to um, bring people into the present to, uh, I mean, I, I think that painting for one is a very responsive art. You know, we're responding to what's out there. We're bearing witness to what we see. Um, so that... Uh, it's a little less crazy making when you think that culture and concert does make change. It does make perceptual change, and it does, in the long term, um, make a difference. But as an individual, I think you have to see it as you're acting together with all these other things. Otherwise, it does seem really overwhelming and kind of useless. So that's just my way of kind of processing that, that idea. Mm -hmm. um, I would also say that I think creating shows like these ones that show both the beauty and the fragile state of um, nature hopefully will create awareness in the community. And uh, when it, it's time to vote, people will elect the correct leaders that will make change because as we know, uh, uh, you know, we cannot make change alone, but we need to elect the, I think the right leaders who can help us go in the right direction. Well, I agree. I think this conversation could have gone on for another two hours. <laughs> so I'm so grateful to our artists that have participated in this exhibition our curators and Virginia to come and help guide us through this conversation. It's just been really an extraordinary experience for us and all of our artists in attendance and our lovely artist council members. We are so glad to have you here. I do invite you all back for our next exhibition opening. I think it will particularly appeal, appeal to this crowd it's called Art Reclaimed. It's 14 artists that were invited in and it will be all installation work. Things will be mounted on the wall, things you can walk through. Like, but it's all work that is repurposed and rebuilt. So it's a continuation of this conversation that we started here today. So thank you all, and I invite you to have some lemonade or a snack. We're going to start the Rise of Ask film for one last screening mm -hmm. before we close. So if you'd like to catch a little bit of that, it starts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.